This time, we take a journey on Her Majesty's Secret Service with James Bond in Moonraker. And along the way, we ask, is it possible for 007 to be more misogynistic? Is Hugo Drax more of a cult leader than a businessman? And how different would this film have been without Star Wars? The name's Sci-Fi. Force-fed Sci-Fi. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Force-Fed Sci-Fi Podcast, where I am one of your hosts, Chris Rupp, and I am joined by my co-host... Uh, James Bond. Really, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sean Moonraker Culp. Fantastic. And once again, we are joined with a special guest, Mr. Colin Hope. Say hello, Colin. Oh, good evening, everyone. We are happy to have you on the show to, uh, today to discuss... Moonraker, I'm a, as a fellow James Bond fan, from what I understand. From the cradle to the grave. <laughs> from the grave. Well, hopefully not yet to the grave. Uh, but yes, Colin Hope is a friend of mine that I've known for several years now. We met at a, I guess at a Christmas party a couple years ago. Yeah. I'd say so, yeah. It was like an ugly sweater party at my sister, and um, he spoke so eloquently, and he was a journalist major, and... So I was like, oh, this guy is kind of intriguing. And I think he told me his plot to one day become the president of the United States. And I was like, all right, this is a guy that's pretty dope. So hello, Colin. <laughs> Welcome on the show, man. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Wanna, uh, you give us your story because that's my shtick on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I am super stoked to be on Force Fed Sci-Fi. Uh, big fan and uh, new fan, but, but big fan now. Uh, I come to you from the perspective of uh, being a lifelong James Bond fan. I've always been capt captivated by it. It's uh, it's great camp, great great cinema tradition. I've uh, always always loved it, um, just for the pure entertainment value. And uh, and now when I get to see it uh, tied in with with all the sci-fi elements as it as it's come from the uh, the old radio and Aston Martin days to the uh, the days of hackers getting to talk about james bond in that nice 70s sweet spot of moonraker oh, is a real thrill for me so thanks for having me i had no problem mm -hmm. me and colin i think we used to well sometimes we used to like watch films james bond together because he is like he has a great collection of the do you have all the bond films oh yeah all yeah all of them on dvd that's right oh my god yeah because so he would come over sometimes or i go to his place and we would drink like crazy beers or have some crazy beverage because this man is like a mixologist from <laughs> he makes the craziest drinks and then yeah we just watch the crazy bond films then just chat about him so when this film came up immediately i was like dude we got to get colin on here because he is the man with all things bond that's right the only thing i wish i had a uh, vodka martini right now <laughs> <laughs> This is definitely one of the more crazier plots in any Bond film, which is which is weird to to, to say that for the Bond franchise, right? Because they're always so well formulaic in a sense, but a little scaled down. You know, it's a spy film, it's espionage, but this film is just it's like they took everything in a book on how to make your film over exaggerated and just like to the wall and they threw darts at everything we need explosions we need women we need space the biggest things ever you got it you say it we'll get it you and say they, that with all the enthusiasm of a carnival barker trying to get people to get into the show <laughs> well we got everything we got the two-headed women we got the brazilian rainforest <laughs> and it's like how it feels in this film well it, it just to provide our audience with a uh, synopsis of moonraker so the the, the film uh opens with the hijacking of a space shuttle named Moonraker and British Secret Service agent James Bond, codenamed 007, is tasked by his government to investigate the theft and the manufacture of the shuttle, Mr. Hugo Drax. And as he begins his globetrotting investigation, which he does in every film, he teams up with a beautiful CIA agent as they have to venture into space to save the world from total annihilation. Yes, it, ju it just, it's... <laughs> It's the same plot as every other James Bond right. film, just the, the, the elements are changed slightly. Ever so slightly. This one includes space. But I think, well, for every Bond film, there's like a formula, right? Yeah, you got, you've got the villain. You've got his, his cadre of uh, excellent henchmen. You've got the girl, the gadget. You've got the exotic locale. And somewhere along the way, you've got the nice spy car, the, ve the you know, whatever vehicle. 
he has, and then you've got, of course, your bone, your bone chilling thrills. Yes, and of course, your your n- nice nasty little quips. Yes, and one liners, and usually some character arc. Like right, we usually learn something about Bond, but this film. I, I know Chris was saying off air that it felt a little stale in the character arc department. It felt very shallow compared mm-hmm. to even films within Roger Moore's catalog of Bond films. It's immensely shallow. There's no real sort of character development for him, even in a marginal way for him. He just is he still James Bond at the beginning of the film and he's still very much the same James Bond once the film closes. You're not going to plumb any deep depths with this movie. It's a vast vast reflecting pool, but boy is it brilliant. Yeah, that yes. that abyss stares back hard with Roger Moore's face. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I think people like the predictability that is the 007 films, at least until mm-hmm. the mid nineties when Pierce Brosnan took over the role, they, you know, the cold open, the title credits sequence, and then getting his mission from M and then the plot thickens, getting the gadgets, meeting the women. And yeah. it all, it all comes ahead in this gigantic vast lair that eventually goes up in flames and explosions. <laughs> And then they, and then he and the the Bond woman have a tumble in the grass or in bed or whatever. And then the, the and cue credits, <laughs> right? Yeah, they used to. I would say for the because I haven't seen all any of Roger Moore's except this one. This was my first. Um, I've primarily seen Pierce and Daniel Craig's, but from what I've seen in like the Sean Connery ones and this film, the Bond films to me used to be seemingly more so like. A sitcom not a sitcom but like a 70s cartoon you plug them in and it's like see bond do this see bond do that it wasn't nearly as um embedded in realism more so in the thematics and the emotions as the modernized ones where you see bond almost coming to grips with ptsd the missions are falling like off the rails these definitely seem more like Let's see explosions and the whole formula. It's it's all it's all spectacle, and that's and I I mean it's vivid and garish, just like just as the seventies were in the Western world. Yes, it's it's a it's a nonstop carnival ride where you it's an amusement park where you go on you 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 pay your you pay your admission you go on all the rides. I want to see space. I want to see the Amazon rainforest. I want to see Venice. And I want to see a pigeon do a double take. Yes, yes. Oh, my God, that pigeon. I totally forgot about that. You, you know what Moonraker is? It's visual disco. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yes. Complete it's... with bell-bottom dress pants. That's right. I am always amazed in, the, uh, in his gun barrel sequence that Roger Moore got away with bell-bottom tuxedo pants. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. You see him swooshing in the wind. Yeah, it is just wide wide open down there like are you gonna put wear boots or something like what's <laughs> happening down with your bell bottoms dude <laughs> i wish that i wonder if they have like any outtakes of how they're gonna mess with the bond in the 70s if they're gonna like try and flirt with hmm how bedazzled can we make bond be and then they tried a couple of them went you know what jk let's just go back to the suit bell bottoms is all they'll go well, i think it was a prescient it was a prescient uh element when they when they said okay let's kick off the 70s and 71 with uh the first Bond movie of the 70s. And, hey, we've, we've got a satellite covered in diamonds. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't Bond with the barrel start with a hat once? With Sean Connery? He had, like, a hat on or something crazy? In, uh, in his gun barrel sequences, he was always wearing a hat. Oh, that's great. Maybe he, to he, hide the baldness? Or... Well, he had several different ones. And Dr. No, it was different. From Russia with Love, it was different. And he always had that kind of gimmick where he walked into the walked into M's office and he, when he came in to greet Money Penny, he always threw his hat up on the rack and it always landed perfectly as being say, okay, well, just the perfect little subtle way of saying, hey, this man's debonair and nothing goes wrong for him. Never <laughs> see him wear the hat though. <laughs> no, yeah. he's no, always throwing never... it. No, just like just like an Indiana Jones stock stock character element. He's got the hat, he's got the whip. It's part of the uniform. It's part of the uniform. Well, I think it's interesting to note how Moonraker came to be in the the Bond franchise as we know it. Well, it's the only sci-fi one so far. Well, total sci-fi, you know. Where... There are sci-fi elements in, in, a, in some of the Bond movies before. I mean, you got You Only Live Twice where they've got the spacecraft that's being, that's being abducted mm-hmm. and everything. Uh, but this is the first one that's actually set in outer space. Yeah, mm-hmm. this one definitely leans hard into the sci-fi elements. But it, it's interesting to note at the end of The Spy Who Loved Me, the film that preceded this, 
up until I think up until License to Kill, they always announced what the next film was going to be in the series. And at the end of The Spy Who Loved Me, it said James Bond will return in For Your Eyes Only. And then then they brought on Moonraker after the Star Wars phenomenon really took hold of Hollywood. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was really uh, Star Wars took hold. And then even beginning with um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, so Hollywood was re-experiencing a sci-fi revolution because uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out within this time frame. So there was this big clamoring for space sci-fi films and someone in hollywood said you know what would be an amazing idea let's put james bond in space and see what happens and thus moonraker was born though he does not rake the moon which i was very sad no i thought this film was going to be about a giant rake at the moon and no unfortunately the moon did not wish that he could leaf so I, oh, uh, yeah, and you did it. <laughs> Kudos to Kyle, my brother. That's to you, buddy. <laughs> There's actually a funny story with Moonraker where um, I'm not sure if this is what Ian Fleming actually used, why he used the title for his book, but a Moonraker comes from a from a story of these uh, people in rural Britain that would t- trying to escape the uh, the customs agent. They brought in some French brandy or cognac or something, and they're trying to hide it from the customs agent. So they dumped it in a pond. And then they were so the customs agent came by, or the excise man came by and says, "Oh, what are you, what are you guys doing?" And they said, "Oh, uh, they pretended instead of uh, they they had this rake and they were they pulled it across the uh, the surface of the pond as if they thought the the moon was a wheel of cheese. They were trying to fish out of the of the pond, saying, "Okay, well, we're just trying to get this uh get get the get this wheel of cheese out." And the guy walked, the excise agent walked off the scene, going, "Oh, a bunch of yokels." And the uh, the smugglers had the last laugh because they had their cognac, and so it, it, Moonraker became a, a term for someone who is a yokel, or rather, you know, kind of out of it. But it later came to be known as someone who kind of reaches for the moon, who is so high up they can scrape it. So, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, huh. it could either be applied to Hugo Drax or uh, our main man James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's interesting to note too, and um, Colin, you mentioned this. It's always interesting to to watch a James Bond film and realize the year it came out because it's very much a like a a cultural watershed it's a it's a time capsule it's it's as a cinematic phenomenon the james bond movies are always a portrait of the year it's like a time magazine cover you you get to see what was important what were the styles what was fashionable what was interesting what people found scary or thrilling what people found dramatic and uh it's you know it it, I, i think it's it's more of a it's more descriptive than your average um, than your average movie and showing so, the sign, signs of the times. So in this film, then skydiving was brand new, <laughs> because that opening sequence was insatiable, man. Uh, it's I mean I've never seen anything like that where Bond gets pushed out of the plane. Because I'm watching this, going, holy crap, did they actually skydive? And you can see the parachutes under the suits, but legit, the, that was real in the 70s, them doing it, aside from the actual actors, because whenever they did the close-ups. You could see Roger Moore, obviously, with the green screen yes. in the background, but <laughs> they actually did 80 skydive, over 80 skydives. 88 to, to achieve is the number effect. I read. That is nuts, It's insane man. How, much they, how much they did. They What's had... insane is that in, at the time, this movie cost $34 million to make. This was... The largest budget by far of any Bond film up until this point. It was twice as much. I think it was twice the budget. I think in the in the Spy Who Loved Me, and it was as much as the previous films combined. And just for context, thirty four million dollars in nineteen seventy nine is over a hundred and forty million in twenty nineteen money. Holy smokes, man! That is insane. That gets you. That buys you a hell of a lot of movie. That skydiving scene, the opening of the movie, I think, uh, was it's uh, Saltzman commented to the director at the time. He said, "You know, um, it took it took uh, this much money just to make Doctor No, just for this intro." That's crazy. It's, it was, it's insane how much money they spent, but it ended up to being quite a profitable business because it what turned out to be the highest grossing. Bond movie. Well, it's even so Golden Eye, even yeah. Doctor No was incredibly high. I think that was 1961 when that yep. came out, and from Russia with Love, Goldfinger. The, so the budget kept going up. I mean, I mean, you can clearly tell it's spectacle blockbuster, and the films mm-hmm. made money. Yeah, it's not like they were you know boondoggles or anything. 
Did you get on your uh, inflation calculator what two hundred million back in the day would be <laughs> as to now? I did not. No. Ah! Well, I'm sure it was a decent amount. If thirty four million dollars equals hundred and forty million today, I mean it's, I imagine two hundred million is probably upwards of like seven hundred million now. Which is just awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> Like we mentioned, the Moonraker unfolds very formulaic given the structure that the Bond films are set in. And so I think this is a good moment to discuss, you know, our favorite uh, moments or scenes, favorite films in the Bond franchise. And Colin, we, you know, we invited you on given your, your love and appreciation expertise in the Bond universe. So what are, what are some of your favorite films or moments in the Bond series? Okay, wow. I mean, that's like asking which of, which of my fictitious children I, w- I would prefer. Uh, <laughs> I'd prefer to save from a fire, but uh, I, I'd definitely have to say uh, GoldenEye, GoldenEye is up there in, in terms of uh, overall favorite films. I, I mean, came to me, uh, you know, growing up, growing up in the 90s, you know, Pierce Brosnan uh, taking down an entire sat- satellite dish complex <laughs> that falls down on top of the main, the, the main villain. Uh, just absolutely priceless. Uh, in terms of classic Bond, I'd always have to go with Gold Fing- with with Goldfinger. That that wry acerbic wit of Sean Connery up against the you know sometimes bumbling bumbling villain <laughs> of of our Goldfinger. But in terms of in terms of you know favorite overall moments, uh, I probably have to say um, the duel between the final duel between uh, uh, Christopher Lee as Scaramanga. The assa- the golden pistol wielding assassin, with whom he duels on the uh, on the beach of some South China Sea island, um, and it's uh, it's spy versus spy, and it's a glorious it's a glorious moment setting up in the very smack dab in the middle of the James Bond franchise. Uh, I think what I appreciate most out of the James Bond movies is, uh, I mean, really, it's it's all it it's pure it's pure fantasy it's it's showing you know what what we what we could really envision ourselves being thrilled by doing and seeing how far we could push that envelope that's what i find thrill it's it's a spirit of kind of uh practical frontiersmanship yeah that's and, that's always so captivating and hmm. everyone loves espionage right because who doesn't want to be a spy do you like on a mission solve some crime get get your partner of choice whatever you prefer i mean that's always exciting you know, it's what dreams are made of. That's right. Good choice, though, man. I've never seen the Christopher Lee one because my yeah, I haven't seen many Bond films, um, but I've always heard that that duel between them is so fantastic in Bond lore. Like I've seen the picture of Christopher Lee with the golden gun, and it's it always seemed intriguing to me. Oh, he as, carries that movie. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, what I've heard. It was one of his best performances in his very underrated career. It's one of the more legendary production stills you will find from any film is Christopher Lee and Roger Moore standing back to back and preparing to face down mano a mano. Oh wow! Like, and to me, some of the best Bond films are the ones where you feel like. He is truly out of his element, and he he's not doing his mission for queen and country. He's doing it for himself. Um, I think Tomorrow Never Dies kind of fits that bill a little bit. I mean, it's it may not be the best in Pierce Brosnan's catalog, but I love the opening sequence of that film when he's blowing up the terrorist arms bazaar, and he flies <laughs> away in a jet, and he has to ejector seat somebody who's trying to choke him from the back. I love that. <laughs> I think the, the, the Spy Who Loved Me is one of my personal favorites, given how dark it was at the time it came out because the Stromberg is just killing people left and right. And it's got a spectacular amount of grit for the time. Oh yeah. And you actually see Roger Moore be physical and you kill people brutally. And he, 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 he develop- uses women as a human shield. Yeah. He, de- he develops this, he developed this reputation as kind of being soft and kind of subbing in the stunt men to do the heavy work. And he had this uh, notable disdain for guns which is I, I always love this scene when he confronts Stromberg at, in, in the, at that final huge table because before that he tried to drop him down in an, an elevator into a shark tank and then as he sits down in the chair he throws a, this gigantic missile in him and it misses so of course he the rules are off the table so he just shoots him to death 
And actually, you were saying uh, off that this film, Moonraker, has a lot of elements from The Spy Who Loved Me. Well, not only that, Cher is the same director. Yeah. But Jaws is in it. He's the only Bond henchman ever to be seen again. Yeah, I mean, it's directed by Louis Gilbert, who also directed You Only Live Twice, which is when a, what people thought at the time was Connery's last Bond film, but it was amazing spectacle in that. I mean, that has all the hallmarks of every single bond film you could ever want you've got the you've got the the fantastic base that blows up in a in, in a cataclysm <laughs> of fireworks at the end you've got faraway locales you've got james bond trying to immerse himself albeit a bit way too forcefully in the local culture well you also had finally we see the the scar-faced villain who's been tormenting bond since the beginning of uh, ernst savro blofeld the head of Spectre, and, and he remained a persistent thread and villain if, for the next few films after You Only Live Twice. And then he didn't, unfortunately, due to, you know, behind the scenes legal ramifications, he didn't come up in a film again until uh, Spectre a few years ago, played by uh, Christoph Waltz, the legendary Christoph Waltz. In fact, in the movie, you only, in fact, in the movie, uh, uh, for your eyes only, he is only credit. You you see him appear again with the we, with the white cat, the the uh, the Mandarin collared gray suit and everything. But he's only credited as wheelchair villain when James Bond picks him up and drops him down an industrial chimney. Yeah, it's clearly Blofeld that he picks <laughs> up with that helicopter leg and drops down the smokestack. <laughs> huh. And, the, and you know, if, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Ernst Stavro Blofeld is your was the inspiration for Doctor Evil. And many yes. and many of the arch villain evil genius stereotype where he's got, you know, the white chair, you know, the the white chair that swivels around petting the the fluffy cat menacingly and, you know, giving a, an overly elaborate death to a spy who he just met. Yet I'm going to tell my entire the entire backstory for my machinations. Dropping your prey into a vat of uh, ravenous fish. I just want <laughs> sharks with laser beams on their heads. What do we have? Sea bass. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can definitely see the moments of this film where they pulled from Austin Powers. They're like, oh, gondola that turns into a hovercraft. Oh, and a speedboat. Like, watching this film, I realized, oh, okay, so this is where Austin Powers it came is, from. It is a self spoofing <laughs> film. Yes. <laughs> there are so many elements that come out of left field regarding oh. Boonraker, especially the the chase scene in Venice through the canals there where it's a gondola, then it's a speedboat, then it's a hovercraft. And then it goes through the chorus of people and they're all doing double takes, staring at their wine bottle as if they've seen, you know, they've been laced. I mean, at that point when I was watching the film, I said, is this really, like, is this a real Bond film? What is going on? I can't decide. Is this a comedy, a spy film, when you, a sci-fi? When you wa- if you watch the previous film, <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's the exact same gag of James Bond's car coming out of the ocean onto a beach. And you see the it's the same actor, actually, who does the double take with his wine. The man with the bottle. Yeah, the guy (laughs) with the bottle. Who Then he appears in Moonraker. And then he also appears in the next film, For Your Eyes Only. So this is a continuing gag they do throughout Roger Moore's films is this self-referential person who's sitting in a cafe or in a bar and sees you know some wacky thing happen with a vehicle and is like hey what have i been drinking and that really you know sums up the whole the whole spirit of the roger the roger moore era for the bond films is that it takes itself pretty it doesn't take itself seriously it's it's lighthearted. it's all about the spirit of adventure and ha- and it's having a bit of fun it's very tongue-in-cheek it, it basically it's it's an entertainment kind of thrill ride. It's an it's an amusement amusement park where you get to go on all the rides. Yes, this film definitely feels very tongue in cheek the entire from the moment it starts to the moment it ends. With the uh, we were talking about the different moments of the moments of the movie. Um, would it be fair for us to go around and 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 say so? W- in our minds, what is the most outrageous thing we saw? Sure, I, there's a big list and a lot well, to unpack here. But. Well, we can. Well, this might be a good uh, opportunity to drop in our lens flare. Yes. So, uh, Sean, how about you go first with your lens flare for Moonraker? Oh, my goodness. There's so much. Because I totally forgot about the bird force double take. 
And that is definitely lens flare worthy. It's <laughs> clearly an edit of the it's, bird like twitching its yes, head. It's, it's clearly an edit that they reverse. <laughs> and it's so bad, but laughably hilarious. It's so bad it's good. That, I mean, the space battle, like the lasers seem like, I think Colin said, like they're drawn on the film. It's hilarious. You see these guys that are clearly hung by wires just slowly floating near each other and then just do, 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 do. It's so hilarious because it's so bad. Reminds me of like a cheesy 50s, 60s movie, like TV series. You know what they actually did to achieve that is they, they actually, uh, they, they filmed it. Then they they put they processed it with the effect. Then they rewound the film and then played it again. So that for that space battle with the MMUs floating in space, that they rewound the footage about forty times or so <laughs> to achieve all those all those effects that were so dastardly corny but so delicious. So corny but so delicious. Yes, uh, I would say either that the lasers itself, the bird, or uh, Bond's outfit when he pulls the good, the bad, the ugly, like reference. That's probably those three just really were hilarious to me. How about you, sir? Well, those were those were all those were all of mine. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Told you to pick different ones. <laughs> but no, you didn't listen. Look, Chris, we can agree on our lens flare. We don't have to be different. So, they uh so in the Roger Moore movies, they are fond of of referencing other movies very playfully. So, they they reference the Magnificent 7 theme where they have uh, they have James Bond in full South American gaucho gear riding up to the to the uh, riding up to the Brazilian uh, headquarters for MI6 and uh, it which makes no sense because okay that's the Wild West and this is South America why do you have a what it's it's West he's on a horse so oh, give, give me a break guys come on you can imagine some guy chain smoking in the writer's room just going <laughs> I don't know, guys. That's Look, good. just drop. I just, want, I just want to get him onto the hang glider. Come on. Look, just drop him. Just drop in Elmer Bernstein's music, and we'll move on. That's right. <laughs> it would be a great idea. Space western, everything. They literally had to have thrown darts against the wall. Whatever you want, throw it in. Well, that was just one of the the things that they kind of self reference in the film because the the key the tone on the keypad to enter in was Close Encounters from the Third Kind. And then um, the hunting scene. Yeah, they play the opening uh, notes for uh, from a 2001: A Space Odyssey. Although it is interesting that um, Steven Spielberg has long been noted as wanting to direct a James Bond film, and the producers asked him if they could use the tones from Close Encounters of the Third Kind in the film. And in turn, they gave him permission to use the James Bond theme in The Goonies, which he produced a couple years later. So, bit of quid pro quo there going on. But I don't think Spielberg will ever direct a James Bond film. <laughs> no, not anymore. Huh. That would be a weird film. It'd probably, what, it would be a prequel probably with child actors because, number one, it's a Spielberg film. So he can never direct an adult yeah, unless it, it's Tom Hanks. It would be it would, it would be a, a young James Bond who's losing his parents in that climbing accident and Mr. Bond is played by Tom Hanks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I had a lens flare. And All right, Chris, so, what was your lens flare? So at the end of every James Bond film, they always show like where the film was shot. If it, And Moonraker is no exception. So it shows London, England, California, Rio, Venice. And then finally, they had the audacity to say that it was shot in outer space. <laughs> that is false. <laughs> it was absolutely not filmed in outer space. <laughs> That's hilarious. What? And they they put an exclamation point on that. They said, "And outer space!" Like we're supposed to believe it, just because it has the exclamation mark there. That makes me want to watch like all the sci-fi films that have been shot in outer space and see if they credit outer space as a location. I think it's also interesting to view Moonraker, given that it came out in 1979, 40 years ago, through modern lenses, and. Let's just say the film has its problems, but it, it it is fitting within the James Bond timeline, but... You mean with the female lead named Goodhead? Yes. And the <laughs> fact Doctor, that... Dr. Holly Dr. Goodhead. Dr. Goodhead. Dr. Goodhead. I'm so sorry. A beautiful blonde lady. And literally the first conversation with which James Bond has... And you uh, can goes, tell... Oh, a woman. <laughs> yes. You can tell Lois Childs just absolutely... Aboard being in this movie, she hated 
her dialogue. You can tell. Yeah. Well, she actually rejected the role at first because I guess they offered her a spot in a Bond film prior and she said no. But then I guess <laughs> this one she decided to take it. Maybe it was here's a large sum of money. Please be in our film. Or maybe she saw how successful it was and it, you know, propul- uh, catapulted the other female. She was actually also pregnant during the filming of the movie. That is really? Yeah, she was. Huh. That's fun trivia. Well, and he he thought he was going to meet a man and then meets a woman and is like, oh, hello. <laughs> this 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 tour just got interesting. Women can't women can't be astronauts. A woman flying a space <laughs> shuttle. What a novel idea. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm always interested if she became an astronaut first and then a CIA agent or CIA agent then astronaut. I mean, how they just boarded the plane. I mean, <laughs> in the 1970s, which one is more diff- which one is more difficult? <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. Just taking over a plane and like no one questioned it. I was curious, like, were they the only two pilots of that? Because they just get on the spaceship, right? And then in the back, they see a bunch of the world's most beautiful cargo ever no they had five they had at least five shuttles going well they had like six shuttles moonraker shuttles that went up from yeah from the headquarters the other pilots in the cockpit i was like are these the only two pilots that are flying like in that one space shuttle and i guess it only takes two people to take a cargo of uh randos i tell you what they did make space travel look very easy in this movie <laughs> yeah that's that's one of my main critiques regarding the the sci-fi behind it it's just it it i don't want to say it trivializes space travel because it i mean because it, it it they make it seem like almost any jamo can go up in a space shuttle and do their thing roger moore honestly looks like in the movie looks like he had a harder time in the centrifuge chamber with the zero g which actually they used air pumping into his face that bruised, bruised his face during filming. He looked like he had a harder struggle with that than the actual space launch. And given there was Chang, who was Drax's bodyguard, trying to assassinate him by, turn, by cranking it all the way up to 11. Mm-hmm. But there you have it. It was very simple. The uh, effortlessness of the space travel was, was you know, even very, <laughs> was very funny. The effortlessness of them lazily floating towards the station for the space battle. I'm like, wow, these guys, they're just slowly drifting listfully towards each other. We're like, huh, there's no debris flying towards them. And, and hey, and this is skipping way ahead, but, you know, when when Nat, when they finally are able to uh, disable the cloaking device that hides the giant space city that Hugo Drax has constructed in outer space inexplicably, um, they NASA goes, oh hey, it looks like that's the source of the problem right there. Let's send up a, 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 pl- a platoon of space marines. Bam! All right, in like five you know, minutes. In five minutes. Like, just send up a nuke. We'll, we'll fix it real quick. <laughs> Good God. They real life great... NASA would have just sent up a missile and be like, well, that takes care of that. Exactly. I, I want that response time because people on the boonies, they call for 911. It takes an hour. Like, God, NASA's response time to this is just insatiable, man. It's, it's record setting is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that response time for anything. Right? <laughs> they made NASA look real good. <laughs> We're on it like a 1950 sitcom. <laughs> uh, we haven't really talked about Hugo Drex as the villain of the film. Oh boy, can we please? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, so l- let's start off with how how this how he is introduced. Oh yes, he he is the best introduction ever. This beautiful. He's playing a piano. Oh, even before that, you get the aerial you get the aerial shot of his California estate that he's. That he and flew in from France, brick by brick from France, <laughs> and you get you get the the commentary for the helicopter pilot who later becomes the first sexual conquest. Becomes dog food bond. as well. Yeah, dog food. <laughs> unfortunately, oh, what what Hugo Drax doesn't want, he, or uh, doesn't doesn't own, he doesn't want. That's right. She also comments too that he bought the Eiffel Tower and they wouldn't let him export it over there. <laughs> Like, good God, man. <laughs> so just to start off with, you're seeing that this guy is the is the apex of global private industry. That's he right. is the <laughs> it, it it's 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 gluttony and it's it's opulence and it's Hey man. It's, it doesn't the film doesn't exactly portray it in this doesn't show any disdain for it either, but I mean we're kinda left to figure that out for our own. And then we're taken on a tour of this very decadent house. 
and we see Hugo Drax sitting at the piano. And he's playing the most angelic song ever that doesn't sync up with his hands at all. (laughs) But I tell you what, how many villains have you seen ever be introduced like that? He's showing his humility that he is soft. You know, here's what I think that that was intentional on the part of the filmmakers because I don't think that Hugo Drax can actually play the piano well, I no. think I think that was just a track and he was just messing around on the piano making it seem like he was playing that that, that was back in the day before actors were that committed to the roles <laughs> they're like well then they aren't Tom Cruise Chris not everyone everything he does in that scene is insecure posturing yeah, he's compensating the entire film. Oh, yeah. Well, because he has two two beautiful companions at the lunch table that he's clearly paid to be there. Yes, my butler has your $10,000 checks outside. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Allow me to proceed to quote Oscar Wilde and then use a sterling, a sterling serving dish to feed raw meat to my Dobermans that will only eat a minute after I've snapped. But yeah, it has tea and lunch brought out on, on this very expensive china. So it's all posturing all the while looking like danny mcbride it's brilliant he's got a very swollen gut with this giant believe the phrase i used was uh jim jones on a cheetos bender yes (laughs) he's just and and no no uh fault to jim jones or uh danny mcbride but i mean it's just you know yes fault to jim jones he (laughs) he led almost a thousand people to drink the kool-aid hey man that is commitment and you know what if he can you know. Jim Jones is a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Convincing monster. At monster that. nonetheless. <laughs> Convincing, but true. He is a monster. But it, he's it, actually much better looking than the than the literary depiction of him, where he's a where he's a wide shouldered, gap toothed megalomaniac with with a bellowing with a bellowing bellowing voice and a very crude crude disposition. And here they they portray Hugo Drax as a bit dumpy. Uh, but still, like, you're a very cosmopolitan esthete mm-hmm. who is Mr. World. He's got the English butler. He has the J- the Japanese kendo warrior bodyguard. He has the, the, the French helicopter pilot. Factories in Venice, factories in Rio. He's well-traveled. I, I would argue that this film and the previous film in the Bond series really kicked off this whole idea of having these billionaire businessmen as villains in future films because later on in the in the 80s we would see gordon gecko and wall street and i mean this is it's prevalent in many films we see as as the rich man as the villain controlling the strings you could say that it was hashtag epic foreshadowing for the many decades to come well, it does. It, well, we're we are coming right. You know, historically, we're coming off of the heat of the, the heat of the Cold War. Uh, right now, I mean, in ni- 1979, we, we there's a I guess there's a brief thaw in the Cold War for a, for a short period of time, but we're coming off of this. You know, this uh, as a premise for spy movies as the as a warren of double agents and you know and crisscrosses and a, a labyrinth of of you know european cities and smoky alleyways and now it's come it's come down to um abandoning the the geopolitics for something that's a little bit more frightening the nebulousness of the private sector and the industrialist who wants to own the world very wow. well said <laughs> yeah. Colin, you brought up an interesting point before we started recording to kind of viewing espionage films through the lens of sci-fi so so where have you seen in other films where science fiction and espionage kind of intersect or, or where do you see those trends g- going in the future you know that that's a that's a great question so the way i kind of see uh the intersection between sci- sci-fi movies and espionage is is in the technology and that's where you that's that's the strongest undercurrent that unites them both because with uh with espionage films it really the 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 source of the source of drama, the conflict, is always about the technology that's going to change the balance of power in the world, or that's going to threaten the human race, or that's going to uproot long-standing traditions, and that's something that we find compelling and and uh, and you know gets our gets our blood pressure up. And with with your sci-fi movies, a constant a constant theme that that runs ever since it's in you know your it's it's fluorescence in the in the 60s and 70s. You see the technology on whether or not it's going to be used for good or evil, and even if even in you know in you have you know your extraterrestrial kind of horror that comes in, but really when we're talking about just 
just humans, just just men and women on Earth or beyond. It's all about the proper use of technology. And so that's where you see the spy movies really, really come in with sci-fi and where Moonraker really kind of excels is not only an entertaining mishmash spectacle, but also something that really kind of sums it up very tidily is that it's technology that, that really drives a, a plot forward with sci-fi or with espionage, the power to destroy. And when you think about Hugo Drax, I mean, he's kind of the most tech, most technologically advanced of all the Bond villains because he's got a plan that's pretty pretty wide. He's got space travel. He's got genetics. He's got eugenics. <laughs> he's got botany with all those orchids that he's that he's uh, used to promote mass sterilization. He's got just about every sort of science under his under his mastery, and he's going to go ahead and use that to destroy the world. Well, speaking of science, very well stated. How would you say the science depicted in this film is portrayed? You know, do you think it's possible? Since we are a sci-fi film podcast, do you think like his probes and everything would be effective? Okay, so if I'm gonna I'm gonna use uh, two two very popular scientific images that we can all relate on the scale of Stephen Hawking and a brief history of time to um, your uh, vinegar and baking soda volcano i'd say it's more on the volcano end <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this man's got a probe made out of glass that he <laughs> shoots over the world it's like this will radiate earth it's like dude it's not gonna make it through re-entry the laws of physics and rationality bounce off the very heavy armor of yes. spectacle on this movie the, hugo drex never struck me as somebody who would be able to explain the technology <laughs> in the film he always like, yes, he has a grand vision, the Thanos-esque plan, you could say, of wiping out the planet and repopulating it, even though he looks like a pug that's about to be neutered. <laughs> <laughs> and yet he's going to repopulate it with all these beautiful people while he just watches down from space being like, good. My good. children. Who would... That was the part that kind of struck me he's surrounding himself with all those beautiful people i'm like who who would you repopulate oh, hold, with on, hold on let me get this sean that was the part that confused that was the part that that, that was really absurd to you everything up to that point just believe sean he's but paying that... them to be there <laughs> not a man biting through a gun a gun to the cable <laughs> well it's i mean viewing it through modern lenses it has these weird um you know uh Nazi Germany vibes along with and Hugo Drex gives off these Howard Weinstein uh, Harvey Weinstein vibes excuse me yes where he's surrounding himself with beautiful women who on any other day would have no business being with him having lunch with him even speaking with him yes his complete genocide of the world for uh, white people <laughs> that's one of the of... few that's one of the few uh, actual ties to the original novelization of Moonraker by Ian Fleming is that um, in the original book, uh, Hugo Drax is actually uh, Hugo Dach or Dacher, which is German for dragon. Anyway, he's a he's a he's a he's a just a great name. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> That's, I have to... He's a Nazi in disguise who's going to take the the missile system called Moonraker and work with the Soviets to achieve the a a Nazi goal of revenge against the British Empire. Um, but you see that carried over into Moonraker just by the megalomaniacal fascistic rant that he gives <laughs> in the uh, in his new space city orbiting earth and with everything I mean with everything else going on the master race but they never call Hugo Drax out as a Nazi or even mention his nationality because he kind of frankly seems as someone who's above all that I think mm -hmm. it's implied that he's French given that uh, Michael Lonsdale himself is French and he has an affinity for all things French so I, I think it's I think it's heavily implied that he's French, like uh, like Stromberg in the previous film. He's clearly German. Mm -hmm. um, like Blofeld, another German Swiss name. Yeah, and I, funny, I'm very apropos that it's French because this movie was for budgetary reasons. It was it was uh, made with heavy participation uh, from uh, with with France. Most of it was filmed. A lot of it was filmed in France with a French production company and. Uh, in Boulogne. Um, well, kudos to them. They they were like, all right, let's film this all in French. We want the we James open. Bond film to shoot here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We shall build the greatest space station set ever. <laughs> and then shoot it with shotguns. <laughs> it was literally the largest, the largest practical set constructed in France. 
uh, I think to this day. That's nuts. And it was three. It was uh, literally three stories tall. They I, they actually built the whole thing. So when you see these sci-fi movies today, well, yeah, I give your graphics editor some credit, but what about the actual vi- visual direction that comes from the practical effects of the '70s? So I I get I, I get nostalgic. I wasn't even born then. <laughs> <laughs> no, you get we... nostalgic about things. Yeah, I feel the same way with a lot of films. That's why we're called old men, Colin. Yet we're young men trapped in old men's psyches. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> Colin. I wanted to ask, uh, where do you think this fits in in terms of a Roger Moore's catalog of Bond films and the Bond series overall? Great question. Would you say like uh, in terms of in terms of quality or just the uh, its depiction of Bond in general? Or- I would say quality. Let's start there. All right. Let's let's interrogate that. Okay. So in in terms of quality, what I what I think of as a quality movie is something that in, is something that entertains or informs me, something that you know speaks to me as an art form. Uh, and I I use the term art form very generously with this movie because it does feature a hover a hoverboat gondola. Uh, it features someone. <laughs> <laughs> it features it features a kill a killer python and which is one of the dude, funniest moments in the film. Oh, oh yeah, it basically so stabs a python in the head with a poison pen. The way I, the way I say say uh, uh, I was talking about this uh, off air earlier. The, the the way I would describe this movie is you give it give a kid one of those uh, refillable soda cans at the uh, fast food restaurant. He goes up to the 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 soda fountain, gets one of everything from each one of the dispensers. I want Coke. I <laughs> I want Sprite. I want Fanta. I want all of it. He just puts it all into the same thing. Yeah, sure. You know, do do you want to go to the, you know the Amazon rainforest? Do you want to go to the uh, uh, do you want to go to St. Mark's Square? Sure, let's do it all. Let's let's just cram it all in. Let's make it as dense as as possible. And then right next to that Bond trope soda machine is all the Bond women soda machine. It's like there's a blonde haired woman and then. And there's a brown haired and a black haired one <laughs> and the red haired <laughs> here's one with her boobs barely showing <laughs> that's right <laughs> they really pack a lot in and it was very feels like a very full plate uh so in terms of bond movies um i had i'd have to say for the roger moore era this is kind of the apex it's got it's got so much in it if you don't try and dissect the reality of it um you know i'd have to say this is probably the most enjoyable time you're going to have watching a Roger Moore Bond movie and he did a lot of them he did he did seven which is on par with Sean Connery after he did his his uh his little return in the 1980s um in terms of in terms of Moonraker's place as a legacy item for the entire Bond franchise I would have to say that this that this stands as a I, I guess as a as the polar opposite of the gritty Daniel Craig realism that we have today, where instead of in the 1970s where people where people's tastes were, I want to go for a little bit of escapism and I want to see a bit of the broader world that's evolving around us with the new jet set mentality and new money and opportunities opening up. Uh, now today we've got at the at the other end in the North Pole freezing our butts off. We have Daniel Craig. Showing his bullet wounds and sweating as he as he tries to figure out his next move, and you contrast that with the effortless kind of smarmy grace that Roger Moore exudes as he as he slopes along from set to set and woman <laughs> to woman. Right. So I'd have to say that that's where I, that's where I would fit in Moonraker. It's kind of on it's kind of the on the opposite end of the planet, but it's still a very sweet destination for us to visit. How about you, Chris? What would you where would you rank Moonraker in the overall <laughs> Bond canon? How does this, how does this rank on on your spectrum? Well, I I enjoy the Roger Moore films, but I've always been a believer that of uh, quality over quantity, and by no means did he make the best Bond films. No, uh, I, I still believe <laughs> The Spy Who Loved Me is his best one, given how different it is from his other films. It is. It does approach that darker territory, and it's shot gorgeously well compared to the the style that we see in his first two films and in his later films. He definitely explores the more lightheartedness of the character, which is, which can be appreciated at some points. But it's like seeing all the humor in Star Wars: The Last Jedi. It just at some moments it just feels out of place, like in Octopussy, for example. He's swinging on vines to escape a bunch of the villain's henchman and he happens to throw in a Tarzan roar. So that's one of the more ridiculous 
aspects of the Roger Moore films. And uh, looking at it through the overall timeline of the Bond films, Sean Connery to Daniel Craig, it, it's interesting to see how the franchise has evolved and what the audience has wanted. You know, in the 70s and 80s, they wanted those, that escapist entertainment and humor. And then Timothy Dalton was cast and then they got, they started to get real, but audiences weren't quite ready for that yet. So, <laughs> and Timothy Dalton doesn't get nearly as much credit as he deserves for being a great James Bond. I think if his films were made in the, in the mid 2000s, they would be as well received as Daniel Craig's films are now. Um I would have to put Moonraker sort of in the bottom half of the James Bond films because yes, it's entertaining as a Bond film, but when you when you really examine it from a critical aspect, you you see that he doesn't have any sort of development. You know, he he still treats women the same way. Uh, he yes, he defeated the villain in almost casual fashion. It it, it it's just very lighthearted. And it I, I'm not a huge fan of the the producers and filmmakers responding to a trend in Hollywood at the time. Granted, it's it's what people quote unquote wanted, but I don't know if it's what James Bond should have done at the time. Felt like if they had continued on with doing For Your Eyes Only and then done Moonraker in 1981, so it would have been a year after The Empire Strikes Back, it still would have been received well. Maybe it would have been a bit better, given that it would have wouldn't have had a rush production cycle. But I, I just think that there are other films that Roger Moore has done, and films that have come after Moonraker that are better than this in the Bond in the Bond timeline. And uh, it also does come down to timing too, because you know they did have for your eyes only slated, but they saw okay, everyone is. Everyone and their mother is cashing in on the on the Star Wars phenomenon and want to get get money get some money for that. So they said Moonraker was already you know a concept before Star Wars. But they said okay, we're gonna we're gonna push this up and we're gonna we're gonna cash in on it. And maybe that's maybe that's unfortunate or maybe it's. And I think that really hurt the the chances of For Your Eyes Only performing well because people were expecting to see that, and then once it came out, it didn't live up to those expectations. Because people were, oh, we've been waiting for this movie for four years. Maybe maybe it'll be everything we could ever want out of a James Bond movie. And well, it's hard to go from an outer space battle to uh, yeah. <laughs> to a, to a to a gunfight on Greek Island. Yeah, I, I agree there. And you know, and when we think about the Star Wars phenomenon of the time, I mean, literally everyone was doing was was doing a, a, a Star Wars movie and ripping ripping it off. I mean, even in even in like 1979, they had Yogi Bear doing Yogi Yogi's Space Race. Yeah. And, hey, boo boo, let's go to space. <laughs> exactly. Oh, hey, boo boo, I'll race you to Neptune. Yeah, they re yeah they rebooted Star Trek. I mean, they literally because of I mean there are pros and cons. I mean they because of Star Wars being such a hit kind of caught on star trek the motion picture yeah that same came. movie or same year as moonraker exactly i mean so th yeah i i mean pros and cons but i definitely i'm with you on moonraker being amazing now i haven't seen any of the other roger moore but i feel like now i'm going to be disappointed when i see the rest of the roger moore because this film is just so fantastical it's appropriate to view them with the right context like especially mm -hmm. his first set of films uh live and let die was the first time a black woman had been cast as a Bond woman. Oh, that's and, that, and at the time, it was very controversial to to show James Bond, a white aristocratic male, being with a, a young black American woman. In The Man with the Golden Gun, yeah, it can be viewed as, um, as maybe like almost a step down from Live and Let Die, but it's still a very quality Bond film, and it has a lot of very tense moments, more so than the films that had come before it because it's a it's a cat and mouse film at the end of the day it's mm -hmm. it's a superior assassin going up against somebody who's fighting for queen and country and i think that james bond films through the years they do kind of oscillate between whether or not they've got their their button on the trigger of pressing the hot button issue of the day well yafet kodo is still one of the best villains ever to be in a bond film <laughs> Gotta love the Kananga balloon. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's clearly a, it's clear an effect, but he it's so satisfying to see him blow up at the end of the movie. So, with that being said, do you have any hype for the new James Bond film? Because I think this is James Bond twenty twenty is going to be Daniel Craig's last one. I mean, that's why everyone's saying I'm pretty sure he's done because he's tired of the role. Are you like super hype? 
for it or I'm always hyped all the time for any new for any new advent- <laughs> adventure with James Bond. Uh, I'm I'm especially excited to see this because just from the initial snippets that I've seen and from what I've read, uh, it's going to be an exciting thrill ride. I'm I'm really excited to see how they're going to, you know, close the loop with the da- with the Daniel Craig envisioning of um, Bond. I think it's going to be, I mean, just looking at the at the the name of the title and the actual just the poster, you know, no time to die with that 1960s, you know, quasi art, you know, post art deco kind of look of the lettering. It's all, it all screams, you know, kind of, uh, you know, this is, this is the end of the class of the classic movies and how we re envisioned it in the modern era. It's going to be, it's going to be a fun thrill ride. One sentence, Rami Malek as a mother effing bond villain. Yep. Yeah. I, I am, I am beyond pumped to see what he does in his role. And I, I'm interested to see who he actually is because remember Spectre pulled a fast one on mm-hmm. us when we thought he was going to, when Christoph Waltz was going to be someone else. And then turns out he is Blofeld. So I, I'm kind of curious to see, there's been a lot of speculation if Rami Malek is going to be playing Dr. No hmm. actually in the film. And I'd be interested to see how that plays out, but it, it's a great cast. I'm excited for the premise. They got Phoebe Waller bridge to, Right for the film, if you're unfamiliar with her, she created Killing Eve. She's on Fleabag on Amazon Prime. She's won all sorts of award for her shows and her creation. And she's, I think, she's a much needed feminine voice in the, in the writers' room at James for James Bond. I'm super stoked for it. I think they can only go up after Spectre's like lukewarm mixed review feel. So I'm super pumped. Sad to see Daniel Craig go, but I know he's totally ready and. uh a little plug for the movie Knives Out if you haven't seen it, or I would definitely go and check that out because it's very refreshing to see him do something outside of the Bond character. So I, I you know, I hope he's uh, it's a kick butt movie and he's able to shake off you know the James Bond typecasting and continue a uh, illustrious film career. Well, I want to ask you guys this too before we uh, move on to our final segments. With this being Daniel Craig's supposedly last film as James Bond. Who do you think will replace him as 007? So I I heard rumors of Idris Elba, and I feel like he would be an amazing choice. I think he's an insatiable actor. He embodies the class of which everything James Bond is. So if it is him, that'd be dope. I did hear that James Bond would be a female. Um, that would be intriguing. I don't know if they do reboot it with a lady, if they'd still call her James. But if that they, would also if be... they do that, I want Amelia Clark to be to be <laughs> the next Bond. Maybe they'd reboot it with Daisy Ridley, so that she could just double dip Star Wars. And... Why not? She's got the chops to pull off action hero, and she does have a beautiful voice, and uh, she's great too. So I don't know. I'd be open for that. I think it would just it would be a different spin for the Bond fans. But uh, yeah, how about you? You're you guys are the Bond fanatics. How about here. you, Colin? Who who do you think could take over the? Uh, the actor's chair from Daniel Craig. Hmm. That's a great question. I really haven't get, haven't given it too much thought. I heard rumors about um, uh, Chris Hemsworth actually. Oh god. Possibly possibly taking that off. Uh, so I don't. I I do kind of. <laughs> I do. I do kind of feel weird about you know about Thor taking. Can't imagine a beefcake playing James Bond. There were a lot of rumors about Henry Cavill playing him too and i could see that but i mean traditionally i mean they were all they were calling J- daniel craig james blonde before and mm-hmm. kind of these james bond has always been t- played by the tall dark and handsome character everywhere everyone from from sean connery on the way down to to pierce brosnan well then daniel craig became that when he was cast and everybody saw how good he was in the movie mm-hmm. which again let's reserve some judgment yeah and so there's a lot of suspension of disbelief i mean what i like I mean, uh, seeing seeing James Bond reimagined as a female persona could be really exciting and a really cool way of, uh, really cool way of ex- of exploring the the evolution of um, of you know spycraft and the way we want to experience our spectacle and adventure. Um, I'm what I'm really kind of interested in seeing is I do do want to see a departure from what I see as the growing formula for James Bond in the information era where it's where the, 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 the giant thing at the end of the day is just going to be a, a monologue about the power of information and collecting it. I want to see something a little bit different and I hope that uh, No Time to Die delivers on that score. Hmm. If I were a betting man, I would put money down on um, an actor by the name of Richard Madden being the next James Bond. 
if you're unfamiliar with uh, Richard Madden, he was on a uh, Game of Thrones. He played a uh, Rob Stark until like just about every other character on Game of Thrones. He was killed off. Uh, he was on a Netflix series called Bodyguard, where he plays a, uh, a police officer uh, protecting a, a British politician. He was. I've watched a couple episodes so far, and the bodyguard just reeks of James Bond overtones. It is fantastic. I'm on the edge of my seat most of the time watching the show. It is incredible, and he's he's amazing in it. He's also set to star in next year in uh, Marvel's The Eternals, and. The, the the thing with the they cat with who they cast as the next James Bond they don't want the actor to outshine the role which is why you never see big name actors uh, like get on with the role I mean it would be nice to see Idris Elba be James Bond or even Tom Hiddleston but I think they're too big for the role it's, and the whole thing about about James Bond is that it is something that it is something that you that you wear for the rest of your life it is a, it is a persona that you inhabit and that you become. I mean, Roger, Roger Moore for Moonraker. He did over some 200 interviews to promote the show. I mean, he was a he was a it was a it was a tireless tireless uh, kind of craft that he put it that he put into the role of becoming James Bond. And it's something that I guess it's 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 something rather unique when we think of a when we think of of films. Um, it's something that you it's it's a it's a persona that's unique to you and that you carry with you for a number of years afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, even Pierce Brosnan, who's he hasn't been James Bond in almost twenty years, and yet he's still he's still always called you know Double O Seven, and before mm-hmm. before that he was Remington Steel. <laughs> That's right. So, guys, who did you have as a red shirt in Moonraker? Colin, let's start with you. Oh boy. So uh, for for those uh, so for those of you who may have noticed in uh, in Hugo Drax's space city or orbiting Earth undetected. He has a number of of who he, he has deemed uh, genetically perfect people, all couples clad in their nice, trim, white, bell-bottomed uniforms, um, that are all you know have their nice, cute little makeout session on the on the flight shuttle up up to up to the uh, up to the orbit. Um, but then you also have the people that are actually operating the mechanics of the space station in different colored uniforms. Um, and you know everyone down from your your radio operators, I suppose, to your space janitors, um, and those are the people that that uh, that James Bond and Doctor Holly Goodhead uh, mercil- mercilessly overpower in their quest to uh, destroy and uh, and disable the space station. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so Hugo Drax has gone to great expense to bring all these all these genetically perfect people up who up to uh, the space station who don't mind killing everyone else on the planet. Um, and yet you've also got this uh, this platoon of space workers who are just there for James Bond to beat up. Yep. Especially the people in the radar cloaking cloaking facility at the tip at the tip of the space station. Just two people just just <laughs> just there perfect and and primed for so it's space. basically <laughs> animal farm in space. We can just call those Hugo Drax's yeah. field hands. It made me wonder what he was gonna do with them after, like, after they radiate the entire planet, just jettison them out of the space station. That was kind of implied because that yeah. was the that was the whole thing that turned <laughs> that turned the tides for James Bond in his favor is when he got Hugo Drax to admit that hey, um, yeah, Jaws and his uh, petite, comparatively petite girlfriend Dolly. Um, <laughs> They they probably won't matter in the new world order because they're not genetically perfect. Who, by the way, pot calling kettle black. I mean, yeah, right. Hugo Drax, he's no prize peach himself. What about you, Sean? Who is your red shirt? Oh well, keeping in tune with our uh, death to animals, definitely the quail scene where we where Drax shows Bond that he can shoot, and then he just mercilessly kills a bunch of birds. Man, just shoots them down out of the sky. That was like. Come on, man. We get it. We we understand. We saw you play the piano. We saw you with the women. We saw your elaborate layer. Just we get it. You're 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 the man. We don't need you to see. We don't need to see you murder birds. So that was that did it for me. How about you? I had one from that same scene. It's the assassin that Drax sends up into the tree to shoot Bond during quote a hunting accident. 
I mean, Drax has already tried to kill Bond in that centrifuge and failed. And now he's got the audacity to try to kill him in broad daylight. You're going to try and shoot a British Secret Service agent, a guy who lives to shoot? You're going to hope to shoot him in, quote, a hunting accident? He's No. Like he shoot, uh, I mean, Grant, I, I don't know how much range that shotgun has, but apparently it's a yeah. deadly shot. Yeah. Yeah, Hugo Drax does have some of my favorite quotes when he comes to when it comes to trying to eliminate James Bond. He goes, he says to says to Cheng before the centrifuge scene, "See to Mister Bond. See that some harm comes to him." Yeah, and that quail scene. Uh, he shoots. You miss. Did, Did I? I? <laughs> Body falls out the tree. <laughs> Brilliant, Mister Bond. You seem to defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you. <laughs> Why did you dispatch with my pet python? Oh, I discovered he had a crush on me. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of that in mind, guys, what do you say we rate this, shall we? Sure. Have you been on the... Do you understand our rating? Well, actually, let me break it down for you, Colin. The four rating scale that we have on Force Fed Sci-Fi is would not watch, would watch, would own, and would host a viewing party. So what would you rate? Moonraker. I would rate this four stars, as in I would host a Moonraker party for this movie. Uh, it is it is an exquisite piece of seven of of seventies camp that I absolutely adore, um, and I think everyone should be able to to take a take a nice nice eye to it. So outstanding. How about you, Sean? I would uh, I would host a viewing party as well. I think the campiness, tongue in cheek, is really everything that I love in movies. It's just so entertaining from the moment and you're not bogged down by dramatically whispering like the modern films that I loathe those elements of modern filmmaking so much. So I love it. I would strap on my, uh, I would say bring your rakes because we're going to rake the moon, baby. Let's oh, host boy. that viewing party. How about you, Mr. Roop? Rup. Roop? Rup. I will knock you out that chair you say <laughs> one more time. I, I'm new here. It is. It is. Rup. R-U-P-P. <laughs> Jeremy edit that out. Uh, I don't like that this film was made in direct response to a trend in Hollywood at the time because it, it totally changed the James Bond franchise's plans. And to include little to no science fiction elements seems like they didn't really care about the trend they tried to capitalize on. They just tried to make it seem like, hey, it's in space. Why don't you go see it? I mean, as a James Bond film, though, it is entertaining and it has all the elements you could want from a Bond film. However, it feels exactly like watching The Spy Who Loved Me, but it's just in space. And yet it doesn't take it itself too seriously, which is always enjoyed in a Bond film. I mean, it's a great Bond film, but it's not a great sci-fi film. And for that reason, I would have to call it a wooden watch as a sci-fi film. But Ooh. I'd have to... As a, if I'm watching this as a Bond film, I'd call this a wood host viewing party. Hey, so polar stark contrast. Well, again, I mean, it's it lacks the sci-fi elements that are in the film are wrong. It gets space travel wrong. It gets shooting things into the atmosphere wrong. It it gets so many things wrong on a science fiction level. I mean, reading the goof section on IMDb is like reading its own novel. <laughs> But as a Bond film, it's immensely entertaining for what it is. And it's it, that's the reason for my rating today. Kudos. So now it's time, Chris. It's time we consult our number generator, Major Samantha, to pick the next film yes. on our list. From our list of 118 films, Major Samantha has selected for our next film. Do, 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 do. At number 91, it is a Steven Spielberg film directed uh, directed by Steven Spielberg from 2008. It is Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I the think... silence means Sean <laughs> is excited to watch it. <laughs> oh, another movie with Shia LaBeouf. So let's rock this out, man. Uh, Colin Hope, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. It really helps to drive us up the charts as well as help people like you find the show. We are across the spectrum of social media with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all at FourceFed Sci-Fi. You can check out and download episodes from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, 
or wherever you find podcasts. And please subscribe so you never miss an episode. Finally, you can check out our website, forcefedsci-fi.com for show notes and links to all of our social media. So for all of us at the Force Fed Sci-Fi team and Mr. Colin Hope, we will see you next time. Force Fed Sci-Fi is written and hosted by Sean Culp and Chris Rupp. Website design, associate producer, and editing by Jeremy Kesky. Artwork designed by Mike Berger. Theme music composed and performed by Custom Anthem.